When thou was baptized in the Jordan, O Lord, the worship of the Trinity made its appearance. For the voice of the Father bore witness to thee when he called thee his beloved Son. And the Spirit in the form of a dove confirmed the truth of the word, O Christ our God, who hast appeared and hast enlightened the world. Glory to thee. Holy Epiphany, the holy theophany of our Lord and God and Savior Jesus Christ, is a celebration of the baptism of Christ in the Jordan and the wondrous revelation that was shown forth then. Theophany, the more accurate name, means the manifestation of God. For it was in this event that the wonder of the Holy Trinity, God, understood as three persons in perfect harmony, communion, and love was shown to the world. Uh, we call the feast on January 6 Holy Theophany or Epiphany. Okay. Uh, those words uh, in Greek mean a manifestation of God the shining forth of divine glory. And that's a reference to the occasion of the baptism of Christ when the Holy Spirit descended upon him and the voice of the Father said, This is my beloved Son. So it's a manifestation then of the mystery of God, Jesus being the Son of God, the Father speaking from heaven, affirming his Sonship, and the Holy Spirit so it's a revelation of the mystery of God uh, as Trinity. O marvelous gifts, O divine grace and forbearance past speech, for behold, the fashioner and master now wears my nature in the Jordan, yet without sin. He cleanses me through water, enlightens me through fire, and makes me perfect through the divine spirit. The Feast of Theophany brings the twelve days of the feast following the Nativity to a close. The forefeast of the Theophany, January 5th, is a fasting day. Wine and oil are only permitted if it falls on a Saturday or Sunday. The royal hours and the divine liturgy of St. Basil are celebrated on the forefeast, unless it falls on a Saturday or Sunday, in which case the celebration takes place on the preceding Friday. There are two hagismos, or blessings, that make up part of the services of Theophany. The first takes place on the evening before the feast, when the priest blesses the water in the church to prepare it for use as holy water. This blessed water, also called hagismos, is given to families for use in times of need. The second hagismos takes place on the day of the feast. In this service, the priest submerges a cross three times in a body of water. This action is meant to symbolize Christ's baptism and the fact that his incarnation sanctified all of creation. The hymns squarely answer the question that Jesus came to be baptized and entered into the water in order to baptize creation. He was the baptizer. The water needed his presence. It was void of God, hence the consequence of sin. So God had to come and reintegrate himself within his creation. Water in the symbolism of the church actually means the creation. And so the whole idea here is that all of life and all of creation is actually a sacrament. And a good way to participate in this feast is to actually, in our everyday dealings and with the environment, to, to see the environment in this way. Theophany is also the one feast that's maybe perhaps most explicitly having to do with the environment and the cosmos because of the blessing of the waters. And it says most to us about our environmental responsibilities. Holy water is an important part of Orthodox Christian life. We understand that, just as God became flesh and dwelt among us, so too can all of creation be redeemed. Just as we venerate relics as containers of divine grace, so too the waters of the Jordan River were blessed by Christ's baptism, and by extension at the Hagismos, the waters are blessed by the priest who represents Christ. Faithful Orthodox families often take a container of the water home from the service and partake of it regularly, especially in time of need or illness. The practice in Orthodoxy of the parish priests going to the homes of his parishioners after Epiphany means he's really he's spreading the water and the light from that feast into the homes in the parish. And um, you you sense its connection with baptism. It's just, it's infinitely rich. 
holy water, the waters of Epiphany that we celebrate in the Orthodox Church, are not supernatural waters or magical waters or, or mystical waters. They are water. They represent water as it was originally intended to be, water connected to God. So Epiphany, by taking the water home with us and we sprinkle our homes, doesn't create some kind of a, a force field around our home so all of a sudden we're going to have prosperity and, and we can do whatever we want to do. And no, 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 quite, cut, quite the contrary. What we are in a sense doing is reconnecting all of our belongings, our homes, our, our very bodies to God. And so now our bodies, our homes are, are created the way they should be. They have a unity, they have a connection to God. Wearing the form of a servant, O Christ, you come forth to be baptized by a servant in the streams of the Jordan, granting deliverance from the servitude of ancient sin and sanctifying and enlightening us. The icon does that by have, placing Christ at the center of attention. Above his head is the dove, and usually at the top, either a semicircle or a full circle, sometimes with a hand in it, will be the voice of God being depicted, who says, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And so it's this moment, not only is the Christ being identified as God, we have a manifestation of the Trinity taking place in the image. We celebrate that with the icon of the baptism. So it's not an icon of the theophany itself, it's an icon about the baptism that reveals who God is to us, who Jesus is to us. O Word all shining, sent forth from the Father, Thou art come to dispel utterly the dark and evil night and the sins of mortal men, and by Thy baptism to draw up with Thee, O blessed Lord, bright suns from the streams of Jordan. The Feast of Theophany is one of the oldest universal celebrations in the Church's history, the essential feast of Christ's incarnation. Only Pascha is an older feast, and like Great Lent and Pascha, it arose from the traditions surrounding the sacrament of baptism. Certain Gnostics taught that Christ was not begotten of the Father, but that divinity was conferred upon Christ at his baptism. Some scholars believe that the Feast of Theophany was instituted to counter this heresy, as reflected in the hymns of the feast. Like the choice of the date for Christmas, January 6th was selected because, according to the ancient reckoning, it was the day of the winter solstice. In the West, this date is associated with the Feast of the Magi. In the East, Christ's nativity was celebrated on this day as well. It adopted the western date of December 25th in the 4th century. The Feast of Epiphany or Theophany in ancient times celebrated the birth of Christ at the same time. And this was a very important feast. It was like Easter, the two big festivals. Epiphany, celebrating both his baptism and his birth, and then uh, Easter. So Theophany has this nice thing that it's the end of the Christmas, and it's some, some kind of a faint, faint beginning of the new year in Pascha. Theophany is based on and seen as a fulfillment of the Hebrew Feast of Lights. The feast signifies an enlightening of the world to the profound truth of God's three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Thus, Theophany is also known as the Feast of the Illumination. Trinity, our God, has today made itself indivisibly manifest to us. For the Father, in a loud voice, bore clear witness to his Son. The Spirit, in the form of a dove, came down from the sky, while the Son bent his immaculate head before the forerunner, and by receiving baptism, he delivered us from bondage in his love for mankind. Like Christ's nativity, his theophany was an expression of kenosis, God's emptying of himself through his humble submission to baptism. Why did Christ, being perfect, willingly submit to the purifying ritual of baptism? The answer lies in his exchange with John the Baptist. John asks, I need to be baptized by you, and are you coming to me? And Jesus answers, Permit it to be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Christ, at his baptism, has taken on our sins and suffering. Christ's earthly ministry begins at this point. The Feast of Theophany, it is an introduction to the battle. 
battle in which that sacrifice is the ultimate, ultimate feature, ultimate center. So, and for the battle, remember what happened with David and Goliath. David uh, uh, offered himself for that battle to be a champion on the part of Israel. And how he was washed and how he was dressed, very much like uh, 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 the act of baptism. Here we uh, venerate David, the king, as a Christ figure, as the one who prefigured Christ who was coming be, uh, after him. So here Christ is truly the very center and the focus of the same election. In order to fight to be a champion for our cause, he has to be elected. Well, first he had to offer himself. I came for baptism. John the Baptist didn't want to baptize him. He said, well, suffer it to be such now. You will understand later on what's happening. And so he offered himself. And then the greatest of all the prophets, John the Baptist, had elected him and anointed him and washed him and prepared him for that battle on the part of all humankind and on the part of all creation. And ultimately, that choice was made also by God choosing his only begotten son as a champion to fight for him. When Christ humbly submitted himself to the Father, the Father spoke, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. At that moment, God was revealed in three persons, the Holy Trinity. The doctrine of the Holy Trinity is a defining teaching of the Christian faith. Unique among all religions, it is a stumbling block for many people who cannot accept the apparent paradox of three persons being one God. Nevertheless, we must remember that God is transcendent, and we cannot expect to fully understand his nature. And if we could, he would no longer be God. As the prophet asks, Does the clay say to the potter, What are you making? Why does God exist as three distinct persons? Love is at the root of this question, which is not a puzzle to be solved, but rather an example to be followed. The Bible says God is love. Christ says, I and the Father are one, and that he who has seen me has seen the Father. The model of perfect love, Christ's perfect submission, and the Father's perfect care demonstrate how we should relate to one another. A model is the Holy Trinity, where you have three persons that are uh, absolutely unique and unrepeatable, yet they are one. So this is what we're trying to do in worship. So this is um, communion, real communion. Isaiah, as he watched by night, beheld the light that knows no evening, the light of thy theophany, O Christ, that came to pass from tender love for us. And he cried aloud, O ye who are enlightened, come ye and wash yourselves, Make yourselves clean in soul and body through the divine water and the Spirit. For all our knowledge, all our technology, and our progress, we are still sinful creatures. Constantly faced with conflict, pain, and distress, we begin to think of the troubled state of man as acceptable or even normal, and our souls are damaged. Only when our hearts and minds are renewed through illumination of the sacrament of baptism, and when our spirits are humbled through our own repentance and confession, can we grow to be more Christ-like, let us focus on the illuminating manifestation of God as three persons in perfect harmony and unity. Of course, we can associate this with our own baptism, uh, which is a call, our own call, to a Christian life uh, and to mission, and to remember that we receive the Holy Spirit uh, at the time of baptism, and God calls us through baptism uh, to be His uh, true daughters and sons in the feast day of epiphany we are reconnecting our uh, possessions our bodies to god and and acknowledging that we belong to him hence god's will should be done in our lives so epiphany is a very important feast without god i am not the way i was i'm supposed to be there's something um, wrong with me there's something wrong with a home not connected to God. There's something wrong with water not connected to God, void of God's presence. It is somehow uh, lesser than what it's supposed to be. So the light goes on, so to speak, at Epiphany, uh, when we acknowledge and realize that God must be uh, integrated in all aspects of our life. Come, and let us go in spirit to the Jordan, there to see a great sight. For Jesus, our enlightenment, approaches and bows his head beneath the hand of a servant. The living coal that Isaiah foresaw is kindled in the waters of the Jordan, and he will burn up the whole substance of sin 
and grant restoration to the broken.